Okay, we've got a full panel today, so I think we'll start now and people will join us as they come in. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here at CSIS. And we're here to, uh, on World Malaria Day um, to talk about a particular um, a project on malaria that's taking place in Equatorial Guinea. Um, this year's theme of uh, World Malaria Day is achieving progress and impact. Um, there are promising signs in the fight against malaria worldwide. Uh, the trend lines are moving downwards, albeit uh, slowly, and there's still a, a great deal more to do. Uh, in 2000, an estimated 350 to 500 million people, um, there, there were 350 to 500 million clinical cases of malaria worldwide, with more than a million people uh, dying from the disease. By 2009, there's about 225 million cases, uh, and uh, malaria deaths are down to 781,000 in 2009. Of course, that we still have a long way to go, um, but I think uh, uh, the, this year's theme of uh, assessing progress and impact is um, there's a lot of positive stories to tell. Uh, close to 90% of deaths due to malaria occur in Africa. And that some of the decreases of the past decade uh, have occurred um, with the greatest decline in much of Africa. Uh, Malaria Day was instituted by the World Health Assembly in 2007 uh, and was, was set apart as a day to recognize the global effort to provide effective control of malaria. It's an opportunity for countries in affected regions to share experiences and support each other's efforts for new donors to join a global partnership against malaria, for research and academic institutions to flag their scientific advances uh, to experts and the general public, and for international partners, companies, and foundations to showcase their efforts and reflect on how to scale up what has worked. Um, so in this case, we have, I think, a very good example of a new kind of partnership uh, between Marathon Oil uh, the, uh, the government of Equatorial Guinea and the Medical Care Development International um, working in Equatorial Guinea um, since in the last three years on kind of an innovative public-private partnership. Equatorial Guinea obviously has many challenges in terms of, of, of governance and human rights, um, uh, but in, in this instance I think we'll hear a little bit about how that government is engaging with Marathon Oil and the partnership to reduce uh, and really achieve some pretty significant uh, results on the ground in terms of reducing uh, malaria uh, health-wise and, um, uh, and uh, and environmentally. We're delighted to um, co-sponsor co this event with um, EG Justice, and I'm going to ask uh, Joe Krauss to come up and just say a word about the mission of, of um, EG Justice, and, um, and, and thank you to you and to uh, Tutu Alicante uh, for co-hosting this with us and, and bringing us this great team uh, of panelists. So why don't you come up, say a few words, and then we'll move right to our panel. Great, thank you CSIS, thank you Jennifer Cook for agreeing to moderate today, thank you for the panelists, thank you for Brian Kennedy for helping um, set everything up, uh, and thank you especially to you all for coming inside today um, to uh, um, listen to this interesting um, talk. Um, EG Justice, really briefly, we focus on promoting human rights, rule of law, transparency, and civic participation in Equatorial Guinea with the end goal of uh, improving lives of ordinary Equatorial Guineans. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. We focus on advocacy. Uh, we do uh, independent research and analysis. Uh, we just published recently a report on civil society and participation in Equatorial Guinea. There's a handful of copies located outside on the table, um, also um, on our website. Um, next week, we'll be, we'll be launching a brand new website that will have um, amongst other things, an information center where um, eventually uh, we will have, it will be become a primary um, source of information for all things Equatorial Guinea. Um, and then one of the other things that we do is we do events like this. We host uh, EG policy roundtables um, where we try to create a forum, a neutral space for um, a number of different stakeholders, um, companies like today, um, uh, health experts, education experts, academics, um, government officials, uh, civil society representatives, to have a space where they can come and discuss ways to improve um, the lives of those people living inside of Equatorial Guinea. 
Um, so we are very pleased to have um, the topic today, which is focusing on some of the positive of things that have gone on in Equatorial Guinea, and in this case, malaria. Um, and so we'll turn it over to Adele Shosh, who will start our discussion. Thank you. Maybe I should introduce our panelists. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yes. Well, thank you to you all for joining us. We, we've really got a terrific panel today that's been deeply involved in this. We have first Adele Shaush, who's uh, Director of Corporate Social Responsibility with Marathon Oil. Uh, he's led the development of the company's social responsibility uh, strategy in Central Africa, including this uh, Bioko Island and, and EG uh, partnership. Uh, Adele is going to speak, I think, to the genesis, uh, the structure, the goals, kind of the overall context of the partnership. Next, we'll have uh, Christopher Schwabe, who is a health and public finance economist with Medical Care Development International. He directs the uh, Bioko Island Control Project and the sister uh, nationwide, e.g., um, Malaria Control Initiative. He's going to speak really to the implementation of the program uh, and progress on the ground. Uh, Michelle Slotman is assistant professor in the Department of Entomology at Texas and A&M. Uh, Michelle will speak to the entomological results and impact of the project and the kind of operation research that his university is engaged on and, and kind of maybe what this, uh, this model teaches us uh, more broadly. Uh, and finally, also with MCDI, we have Luis Benavente, who is director of Improving Malaria Diagnostics Projects. Uh, who will talk about really the health impacts versus the entomological impacts, kind of the health and human welfare impacts of it. And then we'll come back. It's a big panel, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to leave ample time for question and discussion. So thank you all um, uh, for joining, and uh, Adele, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction, and also thank you for hosting us here at the, the center. Good afternoon, everybody, and I can see uh, several familiar faces. Uh, hi uh, to those who are here, we know. I also want to thank uh, EG Justice for actually approaching us to, to, to speak about the subject. Um, Joe um, mentioned that they do other uh, fora on EG, and specifically is going to address the subject of uh, malaria control in, in uh, Equatorial Guinea, specifically on Bioko Island. Um, Jennifer mentioned earlier this is, of course, uh, April 25th. April 25th is celebrated as Africa Malaria Day. So we are here to celebrate results uh, around the world, specifically in EG, but also we're here to reflect on the challenges that are facing us in this particular country, but also some of the challenges are actually reflected in, in much of uh, what we see happening in Africa. Uh, very briefly, before I start into the genesis of the project, I thought I'd spend uh, maybe just a few minutes um, explaining who Marathon is for those who are not familiar with us, talk about uh, our general approach to CSR, because definitely this is a CSR project, then go into uh, why we're doing this project, you know, how we're doing it, and what we think uh, has worked. And of course, Jennifer mentioned you know, the other elements that my colleagues uh, from MCDI, um, from A&M, and uh, uh, Luis, of course, on behalf of the London School, is also presenting on behalf of Imoklan Schmidt. We'll go into more of the details of initiatives, some of the results, and some of what we see in terms of uh, path forward, including the challenges we've seen uh, so far. Uh, very briefly here, you can see on the map, you see a marathon. We've been actually in business for over 120 years. Uh, we are among the Fortune 100 companies. We are the fourth largest uh, uh, oil and gas uh, company in the U.S. I won't bore you with all the numbers. You have them there. Uh, one thing I want to mention here, uh, we have... Uh, roughly uh, 29,000, almost 30,000 employees here, but we are in the process actually of uh, spinning off Marathon in two companies, and that would happen um, actually on uh, June 30th. We'll have a company that will address uh, the upstream business, and the downstream business will be a separate one. I mentioned that it will actually define our path forward and how we do our business. Specifically, the Malaria Project will continue with the upstream, which we'll talk about a little more. You can see our footprint here. We are in the some specific areas, uh, what we call core areas, and certainly the Gulf of Guinea, where EG is, is one of our core areas. Um, I thought I'd share with you our approach to CSR. You know, we, we have a philosophy around CSR. It's based on nine elements, and these nine elements are, are on the foundation of the company, which is the, the values and the code of our business conduct. The nine elements are in, in three categories that uh, defines how we behave, uh, where we invest in, and uh, what we can influence or promote. Uh, so it's basically at a high level, uh, the nine elements. Certainly, uh, the uh, malaria project you know, touches a number of those elements, and I'll come back to that in, in a second. Going more into the strategy marathon, actually, sorry, I went too fast. Um, 
we look at our social investment, you know, with, uh, with a very defined lens, which is this triangle here. A uh, number of our projects are the top uh, tier, which means actually in terms of volume and also from dollar commitment, are philanthropic uh, commitments, which means sometimes we don't look at the results. But the majority of our projects are sustainable projects that are linked to our business case, and we look at them as investments in terms of return for the communities as well as our, our commitment to our presence in certain communities. So we look at them during our presence, but also we look at them beyond our presence in case we have to leave. In many cases, and we are in the extractive industries, we're here for a short, short period of time, and we leave, we want to make sure that we leave the communities in at least same or at least better shape than they were before we came in. How we see this, of course, we are an oil and gas company, so uh, we need to get help. Uh, we need to get help uh, from uh, implementing uh, uh, partners, uh, in general NGOs, non-governmental organizations. We partner with them uh, to make sure we bring the right expertise on the right subjects, uh, whatever is the issue we have to address. In this case, we're going to talk about it's going to be health, so we, we have a number of experts in health. And of course, wherever we are, whether it's a local or national or federal government, we, we partner with the government to make sure they're part of the solution and make sure they are actually enabling us, enabling themselves to move along and find a sustainable solution. Very quickly here, these are the nine elements you, you show in our policy here. So uh, I wanted to show you here a portfolio of activities that we have around the world. I'm not going to go one by one and tell you you can have that. Uh, look at it. Probably you can have it on the website uh, after you load it. But one thing I want to mention, um, Equatorial Guinea, uh, which is the place we're going to talk about for malaria, is probably the only country where we have all the nine elements fully engaged of our policy, where every single one of them has a project or combination of projects. And we feel this is a country that uh, needed um, strong commitment from our end because of the uh, frontier setting, and we have committed fully, including the malaria control projects that I'm going to talk in a minute. And you can see them here in the top corner on the right under community development. Well, I know it's a long introduction, so let me jump into the meat of, of the subject. Um, let's talk about Equatorial Guinea. For, to give you the sense of place here, that's uh, where EG is and Central Africa. Sometimes they reference it as West Africa, but technically Central Africa. It's, it's a country that has um, setting as an island, but also as uh, there's a continental portion of, uh, of, uh, of the country. We're going to talk uh, about the project here at a high level, combining both the continental as well as the island portion of, of the country. But uh, before I do that, I want to mention very quickly how we got into uh, EG. We came in actually in 2002. Uh, we came in through the acquisition of a current asset, and we saw there's a vision for us to be there for long term. When I say long term, we're talking about 20 years, uh, maybe 40 years, with the intent that uh, we will have a long presence and we will create maybe a regional hub for us to do our business. But uh, by doing that, of course, uh, uh, we had to look much deeper into the issues that we are faced in the country. And there's a list of them here. There's a number of challenges, a small population, uh, so we've had issues around education and so forth. But, but the most important and the biggest challenge we've seen actually is a health challenge and that challenge is uh, malaria. One element before I jump into the malaria situation in EG, I thought I'd give you a sense of our business in the country when we entered into Equatorial Guinea through that acquisition I mentioned in 2002. Uh, the, and again, without going through the technicalities of the business, you know, we, we had a business that produced uh, 34,000 barrels of equivalent per day it was mostly condensate, which is um, light crude. You think about it um, just like, like a regular oil. Um, liquid petroleum gas and, and methanol. Methanol is actually liquid that used uh, in pharmaceutical products and actually plywood uh, glue. Uh, what we've done, it's what I mentioned, long-term vision is to, to grow our business there. And we had a number of incremental um, steps to increase our presence. And you can see the, the projects without going th through a lot of details. Either the projects we expanded or we added. The last one was an LNG plant, uh, an LNG plant here that uh, was probably done the fastest ever in terms of projects anywhere in the world in less than seven years in terms of bringing a project uh, from development into production that uh, took us from 34,000 barrels to um, 175,000 barrels. Now, the interesting part about that here, by doing this, uh, we became the single largest private sector employer uh, on the island and certainly in the country. Uh, so uh, our footprint became very large. Our connections with the country, you know, became very strong, particularly the communities where we are. So now that I set the tone on, on the business side, let's come back and talk about the issue of malaria in Africa and EG. Uh, Jennifer mentioned some statistics. I won't repeat them. Uh, we talked about the heavy burden there. A couple of elements I want to add here. Uh, the 
and you can see here on this map, the burden is mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see it on the map with the, the very dark brown um, trace along, along Africa. And certainly EG is right in the middle of that uh, heavy endemic area. Uh, we talk about the number of around a million deaths uh, per year, uh, mostly children. And these deaths are all happening you know, in sub-Saharan Africa. We also talk about uh, the fact that these death, deaths are mostly impacting children under the age of five for one important piece, uh, because children under the age of five have not fully developed you know, their immunity. So they are those at the highest risk of actually uh, succumbing to the disease or becoming you know, uh, severely ill. Um, my colleagues will talk in great depth. EG actually has a very specific type of malaria, which is cerebral malaria. So it's the most dangerous and most deadly form of malaria of uh, any form you can find around the world. A um, couple of elements I want to mention you know, to you in the context of EG. And you have here the numbers, I want to mention that here. Uh, I believe EG was the most endemic country of Africa before the program was started in 2003, 2004. One last element about the context, I want to talk about the economic side. Uh, these numbers are a little old, but however, they reflect the burden that uh, malaria has imposed. This is a financial burden, and there are a number of calculations that uh, show it's in the billions. I think uh, people need to remember that uh, it's in terms of lost productivity because people are sick, they cannot go to work, or they have to care for their dependents, children, and spouses, or because the country cannot attract uh, foreign investment because foreign investors are skeptical about investing because they, they fear the additional risk and additional cost to bring in a business into a country that's highly endemic. So that's a combination of, of what it is to the entire continent. You can look at that at the context of, of a household, and uh, these numbers hold uh, true in the context of EG that within the same margin. You can see the number of that burden uh, on uh, Equatorial Guinea uh, before the intervention, which is uh, around $15 million a year. That's a cost um, that the country is actually subject to. What I want to do here is talk about uh, the, the various initiatives we have uh, around malaria. Uh, my colleagues are going to spend the bulk of their time talking about uh, the commitment we have on Bioqualand, which is where we are as a business. But I'll, I'm going to very briefly talk about what we have done in terms of connections to make this program not only on the island but also nationwide by including the continental portion and what we have done in terms of promoting some of these findings to the rest of the continent through the Corporate Alliance on Malaria for Africa. So what is this project here? Clearly, when we came in 2002, I mentioned we, we found out this is the biggest challenge uh, for our employees and also for the communities where we are. So we thought we need to design a program that uh, can significantly reduce or eliminate the burden of malaria on Bioko Island. And the intent is to, to improve that for our employees, for the communities where we are, and specifically focus on this burden on, on children. For the simple reason, as I mentioned earlier, children are the ones who get hit the hardest because their immune system has not built up uh, that. What we've done, we've done a two-phase approach. We've done a commitment um, of five years and two tranches. Uh, the first one started in 2003, going to 2008, and we just now renewed the second phase of our commitment going all the way to 2013. The total commitment between us and private sector partners as well as, as the government is now $44 million. This is over the period of, of 10 years, and the project is basically um, focused on five major components. Um, vector control, which is mostly spraying. Um, case management, which is the provision of medical supplies, but also improving the health system in the country to find better diagnosis of these cases. Um, information education and communication is a very important piece because we have spraying and we have to enter homes. It's a very invasive process. So to achieve that, we have to have a strong communication so the communities understand the benefit that we are providing to them through this initiative. Um, monitoring evaluation, of course, you know, we want to make sure the project brings results so we have to monitor if it's progressing according to the metrics we set up. Last but not the least, uh, we feel that uh, this project has to be owned by the host country, so we have spent significant interest and significant resources to make uh, a lot of effort around capacity building. And this is towards our counterparts in the ministry and within the program. So at some point in time, we're going to hand over the project to uh, the Ministry of Health. Let me share with you uh, here a little bit more, de more detail about how it works. I mentioned the first phase. In between the first and the second phase, what we've done, we approached the Global Fund, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Global Fund, which is uh, almost like a bank. Uh, the only difference is they don't give uh, loans, they give grants. So when you get it here, you don't have to pay it back as long as you spend the money in a way that is according to their principles. The uh, Global Fund uh, focuses on three diseases, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and malaria. Uh, so we worked with them with the intent that we can leverage the success that we've seen on Bioko Island and take that to the mainland. So through 
a commitment on the technical side with our um, government and uh, NGO partners. We scaled up the project with uh, a grant from us as well as from the Global Fund for another $27 million. So bringing the commitment between us, the government, and Global Fund to $71 million over a period of, of 10 years to have this probably where it is the only country in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that has a nationwide fully integrated program to, to eliminate malaria. Some of the metrics I mentioned earlier are there. So let's talk about uh, the model. Uh, from our perspective, clearly I mentioned that uh, our experience is in extracting oil, oil and gas. So we have to surround ourselves with people that can help us uh, execute on the, uh, the strategy for a health, uh, public health program. So uh, the first step is to partner with the, uh, the government itself uh, to have access to uh, policies as well actually access to, to the workings of, of the nation. So the Ministry of uh, Health and social well-being, social welfare here is our partner along the Ministry of Mines and Country and uh, collectively they represent the interest of the nation. Uh, in terms of the implementation, we have a number of partners. Of course, one of them is, is here at MCDI. It's the implementing NGO working on the ground, but we have a number of technical expert organizations, academic institutions and others. Uh, we call them the technically, technical advisory group. And you have a list of them, you can see them there on the screen, going from Harvard to, to Yale, a and 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 so forth. And the intent of having that group is to bring the uh, state-of-the-art knowledge to this project here from all the research to be done around the world and bring that uh, to help our team and ourselves to make the right decisions. So we are always on the forefront of knowledge and, uh, and development, so we are further pushing the developments and the goals of this project. The tripartite um, partnership you know, works fairly well. Uh, the intent is for us to always bring skills that are complementary. So we, we bring uh, from our side some of our project management as well as access skills. And I mentioned the other level of skills we get from the other partners. Um, Chris is going to spend some time uh, presenting some of the attributes as well as the challenges in, in, of this partnership here, looking at it from an implementing NGO uh, angle. In closing here, I mentioned the commitment we had on Bioko Island. I also mentioned the commitment that we, we have uh, created with the Global Fund by scaling up from an island to the context of a nation. And uh, going to the continent, we thought we needed to do something at the level of the continent. So we created the Corporate Alliance on Malaria for Africa. This is a group of private sector companies that is right now uh, managed through a secretariat by the Global Business Coalition. And uh, the intent of this group here is, is, is very simple. Is, to become a focal po point for the corporate sector. There's a lot of stuff happening in specific countries. You take the case of Equatorial Guinea, there's a number of companies working there. So we have to work hand in hand together so we do not waste the resources, duplicate efforts, and basically dilute the interest of the communities. Also, in a number of countries, there's a lot of grants coming through the uh, Global Fund or the PMI or other international organizations. So the intent is to leverage some of the skills of the private sector and have those brought in to support some of the activities there so we are fully, um, I would say, optimized at the level of a country. So the intent of the, this alliance is to share the best uh, practice and knowledge we can have and making sure there's an uh, advantage in, in bringing that knowledge when a company wants to have a business in a specific country. With that, uh, I want to close and ask my colleague uh, Chris Rabi to come and talk more specifically about uh, the, the, the five elements of the initiative. Give me a second here to switch presentations. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for being here. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, we've got a lot to cover. Um, I'm going to go very, very quickly through the interventions, which Adele already has given us an introduction to, talk a little bit about some of the implementation results. Um, then I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Slotman, who will talk about some of the entomological impact, Luis, who will talk about the human health impact. Then I'll come back and talk about the economic impact um, on welfare of the Aquatoguineans. A brief look at the future optic, because as you saw from Adele's presentation there, Marathon has a long-term vision um, of what it's doing there in Equatorial Guinea, and that provides a very unique framework uh, for an implementing organization to work within um, in terms of combating something like malaria. And then I'll end with a uh, PBO perspective on this partnership, which we think is really quite unique. 
Um, the interventions, as, as Adele indicated, were vector control, malaria case management, behavior change communications, monitoring and evaluation, human resources. Let me just touch on a few of those briefly here. Uh, indoor residual spraying, um, as you can see from the image here, uh, involves putting a odorless and colorless insecticide product, a product that lasts about six months on the walls, on the inner walls of all houses or other buildings where people congregate in peak biting periods, which are uh, in the early evening. Uh, we've been doing this since 2004. Um, it works because uh, in contexts where vector species have a propensity to bite indoors and rest indoors after biting, uh, they're looking for a vertical resting space to land on. They find the insecticide inter interrupts the transmission process. So it's, it's not a mosquito killing <laughs> venture. It's a, it's a malaria interruption uh, process. Um, in addition to IRS, which was introduced uh, in 2004, uh, in 2007 we um, uh, distributed and hung uh, long-lasting insecticide-treated nets in all of the houses, uh, and one per sleeping area on the, on the island. We use two different chemical products, two different insecticides, and so we've actually got a rotational insecticide management strategy going on because if the mosquito is not getting killed by one insecticide on the net, He's getting killed, we hope, by the other insecticide on the wall. Uh, in addition to these core interventions, we're also looking at um, some other options. Um, the the, the uh, transmission characteristics on the island have changed uh, substantially since we started, uh, and as a result, we see quite a heterogeneous transmission characteristic uh, that differ from different localities. As such, we're looking at a number of different options to address and try to bring down malaria in the areas that have been most intransigent. And we're looking for solutions that may be a little bit more um, easy to implement than indoor residual spraying, which is an incredibly labor-intensive and demanding uh, venture. One of those new products is this uh, zero-vector durable wall lining, which is uh, featured up here, the blue stuff, which uh, we've done some studies on acceptability in Equatorial Guinea, and there's a high degree of receptiveness to this product, in, particularly in the traditional housing that's, that's made of wooden clabberts. Um, and so this kind of serves as a screen, but it also has a five-year lasting, at least we're told, insecticide product on it. And our initial three-year evidence on, on actual kill rates is that it does last for three years at least. So, uh, and we're continuing to evaluate that. In addition, for focal supplementary control measures dependent on the area and the transmission characteristics, we're looking at introducing screening of homes, particularly the eaves where mosquitoes come into the house. We're looking at the use of repellents. We're looking at larviciding and environmental management, but these are adjuncts to the core strategies that we're, that we're implementing. Uh, the second major component is improved diagnostics and treatment, and that's involved the replacement of monotherapies largely based on chloroquine with artemisinin and combination therapy. This was done in 2005. Um, we've improved diagnostics of malaria, <coughs> introducing rapid diagnostic tests for free at all facilities that don't have a laboratory. Um, those that do have a laboratory, we've strengthened the microscopy in those places, and on an annual basis, we recycle all of the providers and all the diagnosticians through regular training to try to improve that. And in, starting in 2010, the government has committed itself to a primary health care initiative that has moved this down now to the community level. We had previously been operating at the hospital and health center level. Uh, one of the new innovations uh, and something we're very proud of is that we've been participant in developing the first African malaria slide archive, which is used for quality assurance and accreditation, and this involves setting up uh, replicates of individual um, slides from, from pe people that have different species of malaria and different densities of malaria. And so these slides can then be matched or put in different combinations and you can test microscopists. All of these slides have been validated by a group of WHO certified experts around the world. So we have, the, we have, we have a gold standard. We have true, you know, cases that can be either positive or negative that can be evaluated. And from that we can actually test and improve the quality of uh, diagnostics. <clears throat> we put a lot of effort into improving intermittent preventive therapy for pregnant women and in particular ensuring that they have a dose of this in the second and third trimester of uh, their pregnancy and through that, um, in order to do that, have strengthened uh, antenatal care services as well. Uh, the third major component is behavioral change communications based on a national communication strategy that tries to get at some key behaviors that we're changing, which include early care seeking for children, um, acceptance of IRS twice a year, which is a very invasive uh, process, and people need to 
be available to do that. Um, use of nets by under 15 year olds and pregnant women. Um, the use of IPTP and in, in preventive therapy, as I just mentioned, and advocacy for decision makers so that we have the collaboration of government at the central and local levels uh, in the country. Um, this is done through a series of communication strategies, including community outreach. The picture in the upper right is a brigade of uh, people that go out with each spray round, uh, literally visit every house twice a year with a multi-dimensional series of messages. And if the people can't hear them, they get a blowhorn right in the uh, right in the ear. But no, this is a f actually a very effective way of communicating. Not not the megaphone per se, but that group. Um, they also link up with community leaders. Uh, who are very actively involved uh, through the Ministry of Interior in actually uh, competing with each district competing against each other to try to uh, have the best coverage rates. Um, in addition, in the bottom here, we have a lot of activities that are on communication at the health facility level, both through the provider and for patients and caregivers that are there, mass media through television and radio and print media, and then advocacy um, events, uh, including uh, workshops, symposia, um, and other advocacy events for government. <clears throat> the fourth major component, and really a very, very important part of this, and I think a unique element of this, um, about 15% of the total budget goes into monitoring and evaluation. It's an unprecedented <laughs> monitoring and evaluation system. It gives us probably, I would say modestly, the best data set on malaria in the world. Uh, it rivals for people that know the Garkey project, and that, uh, that data set, this is the new Garkey right here. And it will be used, I'm sure, for many years to come to analyze the effectiveness of malaria. Um, it's a comprehensive system that we make all decisions based on. We have information in all areas. Uh, it's based on a set of indicators that have been agreed to nationally and with WHO that monitor progress and impact. And there's a dashboard that they can follow in the government and we follow on a monthly basis to see where we are with this. A key element of this is a sentinel site surveillance system that operates out of 19 sites around the island that are geographically representative of the malaria dispersion. It monitors vector transmission, and currently that's done through light traps and human landing catches, uh, but it also monitors the prevalence of disease. The core element of that is an annual malaria indicator survey, which looks at parasite infection rates, hemoglobin for anemia, illness history and care-seeking behavior, knowledge, attitude and practice related to malaria. A lot of information on economics, which we'll present a little bit of here today. Each five years, including before we started, a, an assessment, questions to look at under five mortality, which we'll also uh, present here. And on two events, uh, looking at um, serology um, to, look, uh, to look at whether or not there are antibodies for malaria and how that has changed over time as a metric for evaluating um, the force of transmission and the impact of the project. We are <coughs> have done quite a bit with georeferencing, but we're doing a heck of a lot more with it now. All houses are actually in the process of being georeferenced on the island uh, so that we can plan and monitor activities on a household basis. That's either being done using satellite imagery or we're creating maps based on um, GPSing of the houses. We're also mapping the transmission characteristics uh, of the island and looking at risks of transmission and risks of importation and characterizing the island, the island because we do have a very heterogeneous transmission phenomenon going on. Um, and then we see this as being a core element of the future elimination strategy once we get levels down to very low levels of incidence where we're actually going to be tracking individual cases and having focal response to that. Um, because Equatorial Guinea is probably one of the least developed government systems that I've ever seen in Africa, and I've worked in southern Chad and southern Sudan and southern Madagascar, uh, it's surprising, I mean, it, uh, but it's not surprising given its history. A lot is changing, but a lot needed to change. And so when we came in, there was no national health information system. So a project that was supposed to do malaria soon found it needed to set up a health information system for the country, which is far more than malaria. So we've done that and worked, and we now for the last two years have, I think, the first two years of re reliable data out of that system nationwide. Um, computerized, semi-computerized drug information system and uh, PDA-based sprayer and productivity and quality um, systems that allow us to track not only what we're doing but how we're doing it. <clears throat> As Adele mentioned, um, a huge part of the last uh, phase of this, in fact, 10 percent of that $27 million is going into human resources development. Uh, coming into this second phase, 97% um, of the people that worked on this were Equato Ghanaian, but that was operational. The people that managed the project were still foreigners. And so the, the, the 
emphasis of this last, of this round now, is to systematically go through a process of transferring responsibility to this group of individuals here, who are the next ger generation of malaria people for the country who are currently in Peru being educated. They'll be back in June. We'll go through a benchmark systematic handover over the period of about a year and a half. We anticipate that they will actually run the program under funding from Marathon in the final year of the project, and we'll talk about the future after that. Um, so this is a very big commitment on that. So let me briefly touch on some of the uh, operational results before looking at some of the impact. Um, we've achieved greater than 80 percent coverage in all but uh, two rounds of spraying. Uh, we had some real difficulties when we started up the second phase, um, including the fact that there's a housing boom going on on the island and we lost track of how many houses. That It's literally grown at about 20 percent per year. That's new houses and houses building. And we uh, we got down to a period where we actually had about less than 60 percent coverage. Uh, so we've now got that under control, and we're and so we're doing that. That's about 36,000 houses, or about 200,000 rooms that are sprayed twice a year. Um, we started originally with a perithroid insecticide and found that there was resistance to that product, and so switched at great cost to Marathon, uh, which I'll explain again later, uh, to a carbamate, which required two rounds of spraying per year. And so one of the big preoccupations with the project is looking at insecticide resistance. And Michelle and his group at Texas A&M and the IVCC at Liverpool are working with us to help um, make sure that that insecticide resistance plan is uh, up to date. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the outputs of the project in terms of uh, understanding malaria control and the impact of these interventions is that we've got very good evidence that if you can get 80 percent coverage of IRS, not only are the houses that are sprayed protected, but anybody that's living in a house that's not sprayed in that same community through a communal effect is protected. And so that's one of the lessons that's been learned with the data from Bioko. As I said, in 2007, we distributed and hung uh, one net per sleeping area in the whole island. We achieved uh, the highest coverage rate on, among under five-year-olds at the time. Um, over 75 percent of those children were sleeping under a net the night prior to the interview. But unfortunately, because this wasn't done on a nationwide level um, and all Aquatoguineans have relatives living on the mainland, uh, there was a phenomenal leakage of nets very quickly out from the island. A year later, we were down to 35 percent coverage, and a year later, we were down to 5 percent coverage. So in three years, we went from the highest level in Africa to less than when we started. Uh, and uh, that was really troubling. It wasn't what we expected, but we've responded to that. Among pregnant women, that was a little better because we have a keep up program that goes through the ANC clinics, uh, but evidently it wasn't good enough. The government has committed to a new round of distribution nationwide with its own resource through something it calls the Social Development Fund, and we anticipate that that will happen in the latter part of this year, early next year. Uh, <clears throat> That's important because one of the other lessons that we've learned from the Bioko experience is that there's a great deal of synergy between those two interventions together. Uh, and it's, so it's good to do IRS. It's probably equally as good to do bed nets alone, but it's even better to do them together. So in terms of the houses that have both of those interventions have by far the lowest level of parasitemia on, on the island. Um, in the case management area, we've um, had 100% uh, of the government facilities supplying drugs and treatment. We've had no stockouts, if you can believe that, and uh, we have an increasing proportion of women taking uh, anti, uh, IPT. That's still only about a third of the women, but fortunately 90 percent of women in Equatorial Guinea go at least for one ANC visit, so we feel that we can make some headway there. Uh, in terms of knowledge, we've made some progress. Um, the percentage of uh, respondents who knew that mosquitoes transmit malaria has gone up. Knowing that not all mosquitoes are responsible for that is an important message. Also has gone up, but not quite as much. Um, knowing that, that ITNs or bed nets and even IRS are effective means of controlling malaria, that's very high and has gone up. And uh, that, in fact, services like this are free of charge. Um, that's also an important piece of information that they need to know. So with that, um, I will turn the floor over to Michelle to tell you a little bit about the entomological impact of the project. All right. Um, as Chris mentioned, this, uh, the BIMCP has quite an extensive vector and monitoring evaluation um, program. And one of the key uh, forms of entomological monitoring is keeping track of uh, mosquito abundance. And this allows us to know if our vector control activities actually have an impact on the mosquitoes that um, are um, 
um, that may transmit malaria. So initially we did this using uh, window traps and they collect mosquitoes that try to exit the house through windows. And it was quite effective early on, uh, early on in the BIMCP when vector abundance was quite high. Um, what we've done here is we've plotted the abundance of Anopheles fenestus and Anopheles gambi, which are two of the primary malaria vectors on Bioko Island before the uh, control started. And we plotted it over a, five, a four year period of the BIMCP. And as you can see, um, after the first IRS round in which Barifroid was sprayed, there was a remarkable drop in the number of Funestas mosquitoes. In fact, Funestas was virtually eliminated uh, from the island. However, we didn't see the same thing in Anopheles gambi, and only after we switched to, uh, switched to carbamate um, insecticide in, um, in spray round two, we saw a huge drop in Anopheles gambi as well. So um, anti-vector interventions do not only um, reduce vector abundance, they can also change the composition of vectors in various locations. So here we have um, some composition information for various species. Uh, we see that Funestas went from 45% to virtual elimination, but another vector on the island, Anopheles melas, um, also um, de declined in uh, abundance, going from 10% to 3%. Now, even though um, Anopheles melas is um, declined in frequency on the island. In some of the locations, it's still the most abundant vector present. For example, in the southwest area here, um, which is called Luba, we see that there are 86% um, Anopheles melas mosquitoes. And this kind of evidence is important for vector control strategies because these vectors all have different characteristics. Um, for example, Anopheles melas doesn't have the gene that confers resistance against pyrethroid insecticides that were used in the first spray round and whereas this, the frequency of this gene went up in Anopheles gambi. Um, also, um, Anopheles melas is traditionally thought of to be a more outdoor feeding species, so it wouldn't be uh, targeted as much by indoor-based uh, vector interventions. Um, so, you know, the BMCP's anti-vector interventions have been indoor-based so far, I, um, IRS and um, ITNs. And um, there's some evidence to suggest that this has actually led to a change in the vector biting behavior of Anopheles gambi. So that's the major vector on the island right now. And in the, in the literature is generally described as being an um, indoor feeding species. So here we have um, mapped the, um, the uh, sort of the number of outdoor and indoor feeding Anopheles gambi over a 12 hour period starting in the early evening until the early morning. And what you can see here is that the outdoor number of the number of outdoor feeding mosquitoes are as high or even higher than the indoor feeding and that they peak at around 10 to 11 in the evening. Um, so this finding that outdoor biting occurs um, during a time when human adults are likely to be active outside has huge implications for, uh, for vector control. Um, basically, that underscores the importance of having a, an important or an extensive vector monitoring system in place, but also to have a um, basically a malaria control program that can adapt to these uh, changes in entomological characteristic and, and switch tactics. And that is um, something that Dr. Schwabi will address later on when he will talk more about the nature of the, the funding and the public-private uh, partnership that exists in, in Bioko Island. So really what we're aiming for is a reduction in the um, the force of transmission and the way we measure that is um, by looking at the EIR, is the entomological inoculation rate, and that's basically the number of infective bites that a person receives on average in a single year. And there's two components to this. First is the number of mosquitoes, and the second is the, the proportion of mosquitoes that are capable of transmitting malaria. Um, ideally, you'd like to reduce both, but even if you reduce one, you, you can still reduce the EIR. So this graph shows that the um, BMCP had really quite a substantial impact on reducing the force of transmission, going from an EIR of close to 600 in 2004 to um, about 100 in 2010. So that's from going uh, from approximately two infective bites a night to um, you know, one infective bite every fourth night or so. Um, this has already led to a, quite a, a, an important reduction in malaria on the island, um, something that Dr. Benavente will talk about in a few minutes. Um, but if we want to move towards eliminating malaria from the island, we really need to reduce the EIR to zero. 
Um, an important part of vector control consists of insecticide resistance management, of course, and for this we need um, information on what kind of resistance is present. Um, we do that in several different ways. First, uh, we monitor the, the frequency of genes that confer resistance against insecticides. Um, we also expose live mosquitoes to insecticides and by um, exposing them to a specific amount for a specific um, um, amount of time. And that gives us a pretty good idea of you know, how effective an insecticide or various insecticides actually are at, at killing live mosquitoes. Um, now there's also a thing called metabolic resistance and in, in this case there are enzymes that um, break down the insecticide inside the mosquito and they're present at higher levels and, and we have colleagues at the uh, Tropical School of Medicine in Liverpool, England that are investigating um, this issue. Um, so switching or rotating between insecticide classes is usually it's a recommended uh, practice um, to prevent the emergence of insecticide resistance. And the way that basically works is um, you hit a mosquito population with an insecticide in one class that works in one particular way, and then a little bit later you hit it with an insecticide that belongs to a different class of insecticides and has a completely different uh, mode of action. Um, so in addition to these uh, monitoring and evaluation um, efforts, um, the BIMCP also supports, supports more uh, basic scientific research that will have um, implications for um, future control as the um, island moves toward uh, elimination. Um, this research is done by my team at Tex A&M and also we have colleagues at Yale University and of course personnel from MCDI and um, the Ministry of Health of Equatorial Guinea are involved as well. And there are several components. First one is looking at vector migration. Uh, we have a project looking at mosquito population size, and then uh, our colleagues at Yale are um, doing a modeling study of insecticide resistance. So in the migration study, really the, the question we're trying to answer is, you know, what's the level of migration from the mainland um, to Bioko Island? And this critically important uh, question when we're talking about moving towards uh, eliminating malaria as, as m the reimportation of mosquitoes is an, a, potentially an important source of reintroduction of malaria um, to the island. So basically the way we do this is we um, look at genetic variation in populations on, on Bioko Island and on the mainland and try to see how much of that variation is shared or if these uh, mosquitoes are genetically uh, distinct. And this will answer several questions. For example, um, you know, what's the probability of this species reinvesting <coughs> Um, Bioko after um, elimination or um, also even um, other questions such as, you know, what are the uh, chances of insecticide resistant genes moving from the mainland to Bioko Island. So I won't go into uh, too much detail, um, but we do have some preliminary results. So here I um, present a tree in which um, each gene from a specific individual is represented by one of these round dots or squares and they are clustered based on how similar they are to each other. So all the uh, individuals here are very close to each other and they're quite different from the ones that are in different clusters. Okay? So all these clusters over here, okay, that's all Anopheles melas, and all the ones in here are um, Anopheles gambi from Bioko and the mainland. So there's two observations. First of all, there's quite a lot of um, very different clusters in Anopheles melas suggesting that in fact there may be multiple under previously undescribed species within this, um, this um, taxon. But more importantly, down here, okay, we have all the Bioko individuals, okay, of Anopheles melas, and they're all very different from all the mainland Anopheles melas, and they do not share any of the genes with the mainland population. So that indicates that Anopheles melas is completely isolated on Bioko from the mainland population. But if we look at Anopheles gambi, the situation is completely different, and in fact, all those samples from the Bioko and the mainland are intertwined and there is no genetic differentiation between the mainland and Bioko, suggesting there's quite a lot of migration uh, within this species from the mainland um, to Bioko. And so that's very important knowledge, of course, if you ever talk about um, you know, moving towards elimination, then really we need to um, think about introducing new um, methods that um, prevent the reimportation of mosquitoes from the mainland. So another study we're doing is looking at um, mosquito population size and we're using genetic methods for this. Um, previously I've shown you a reduction in abundance based on window traps and now we use human landing catches and light traps which show a reduction in abundance as well. But they might not uh, be simply measuring uh, how many mosquitoes are out there but also uh, behavioral changes. For example, mosquitoes may be um, learning to avoid us. 
So um, by using genetic methods, we can get at some, some data that we cannot get at by, um, by using these, these um, collection methods. Um, so basically, we want to know how big an impact are we actually making on the size of mosquito populations by using these control methods. And um, you know, did the mosquito population size decline after we started to control? Um, is there a continual decline or um, is it moving back up with resistance, et cetera? And also, you know, do IRS and, and, and bed nets um, in affect mosquito sizes uh, differently? And finally, you know, is there a difference in the response between different species? So this work is in the process of being completed, but right now I'm showing you some data from um, the part of the island with the highest level of transmission, that's Mongola. And there we estimated the ancestral mosquito population size, that's before the control started, was around 20,000 in this particular area, and that it has been reduced to about 3,000. Okay, so that's quite a remarkable reduction in, in mosquito population size. Um, that's about a seven-fold um, reduction. And uh, we also estimated the time at which this occurred. Now, the signal in the data for this, um, for this is not very strong, meaning that we cannot pinpoint the time of the reduction very accurately, but it does um, correspond very nicely to the um, initiation of the BIMCP. And since we don't really have any other explanations for why we would have had such a, a huge reduction in population size, it's um, safe to assume that this was due to the, uh, the BIMCP control meshes. Um, now, it does seem that um, these, uh, the start of the, the IRS programs had an initially large impact on mosquito population sizes, but we don't really see a strong signal for a strong decline after that. So after that, mosquito populations either remain constant or, or slowly decline. And this is one of the reasons why um, the BIMCP is also looking at um, alternative or additional uh, control methods. And it does also suggest that um, IRS by itself is not capable of, of eliminating mosquitoes from, from Bioko. Um, finally, our colleagues at Yale are doing an insecticide resistance modeling study, and basically the question here is, you know, at what um, insecticide uh, um, frequency does the efficacy of control um, reduce to such a point that we really need to think about switching to another insecticide? Okay. And this information is crucial for determining when changes in insecticide need to be made or how often um, we need to rotate between different insecticides, not only to prevent the emergence of uh, resistance, but also to ensure that we have um, effective control measures. And so um, the models are still a work in progress, although some preliminary results show that, show that insecticide resistance actually has a very large impact on, um, on EIR, the force of transmission, showing that in the presence of insecticide resistance, the EIR can be uh, increased by about 50%. And here I show some data from the EG mainland in which it sh um, shows that resistance frequency of a, of a, a gene or the, um, the frequency of the uh, gene that provides resistance against pyrethroid insecticides was actually quite high uh, in the mainland before the control started already. Um, um, the control was done by the Global Fund project that Dr. Shaush mentioned earlier and it used pyrethroid insecticides. And after this um, spraying was initiated actually the frequency of, the, of this gene uh, went up quite dramatically, almost uh, uh, reaching fixation. And um, the project didn't really have the financial flexibility to switch to carbon mates, as was done on, on Bioko, and that's um, something that uh, Dr. Schwabi will talk about um, again later as well. So all these findings uh, kind of demonstrate how critically important it is to have an effective monitoring system in place, but also um, to have a malaria control project that's um, flexible enough to be able to adapt to these changing entomological characteristics and um, um, adapt the vector uh, control strategy. And that wasn't possible on the mainland, but it has been possible on Bioko. Um, and this slide it just um, summarizes some of the results from the modeling study, and we actually decided to skip this in the interest of time. So with that, I will um, pass it on to Dr. Buenavente. We did our baseline in 2004, and in this uh, group, uh, children between two and five years of age, the proportion with malaria parasites was 40, 42%. As you can see, over uh, the time, uh, the life of the project so far, we have decreased 55% the proportion with malarial parasitemia. We have not eliminated transmission, as Michael said, and 
uh, this reduction is comparable with uh, similar programs doing indoor spraying in Limpopo and in Mozambique uh, and the northern part of uh, South Africa. Uh, we are not uh, monitoring only children under five. We are doing also school children, pregnant women, and in selected sites, the general population. Um, what you can see in this uh, slide is that uh, there is a significant variation between different uh, regions, between uh, subdivisions of this island. This is an island that is only 70 miles long, but a fairly heterogeneous. It has swamps, it has mon mountains, forests, etc. So as, as you can see, um, the blue means that parasitemia de decreased significantly and red that got worse during the life of the project, comparing 2004 and 2009. You can see there are still areas of persistent parasitemia, uh, particularly in the northwest quadrant. This map shows you the reduction on, uh, in the proportion of individuals with antibodies against malaria parasites. Why we added this? Essentially is because parasitemia is a little unstable. Uh, malaria parasitemia may vary seasonally, even in the same season may vary between lo uh, locations. So this is a more stable indicator. As you can see, the reduction was significant and as expected, the lowest in the northwest quadrant that is flat, uh, a swampy area. This is the proportion of the children with marked severe anemia, hemoglobin under eight grams per deciliter. And this mirrors very, very closely the proportion of pregnant women with marked severe anemia that came down from 14% in 2006 to 3% in 2009. So this is very uh, encouraging. Um, the reduction in, gen in total anemia wasn't as significant, but uh, we, we believe that most of the anemia is caused by nutritional causes for very, very poor diets. And what is the, the malaria control program essentially reduces is, is the proportion with marked severe anemia. Uh, what I'm going to present now is uh, the way we measure child mortality rate. Uh, essentially, we collected with a module very similar to the demographic and health surveys, uh, reproductive histories, and then express the number of deaths per 1,000 live births. As you can see, after the, the project conducted a malaria vector control, uh, there was a significant decline, almost two-thirds, in uh, the proportion of uh, the, the rate of uh, under five death. It's not just infant, it's under five. Because there was no evidence of other substantial improvements in disease control efforts, uh, such as immunization, sanitation, uh, we conclude that the uh, high coverage of effective malaria control interventions is the likely cause of this reduction. And uh, um, it's not only malaria-specific deaths, that we are reducing, but also uh, causes of death that are indi indirectly associated with malaria, such as pneumonia, anemia, and malnutrition. In uh, Ombioko Island, as well as in the continental part of Equatorial Guinea, HIV prevalence is very low, less than 1% of the children, so we don't think it's, this is a confounder. Um, in summary, um, malaria w was uh, the most uh, frequent cause of ch child death in Equatorial Guinea. There's evidence that high coverage with effective malaria control interventions um, are associated with decline, significant decline in mortality. And uh, this is associated with simultaneous decline in malaria, the prevalence of infection, anemia, fever, and uh, the number of infected mosquitoes, as uh, Michael presented no other changes in health interventions targeted to children. And this is, uh, an imp this, this is uh, associated uh, with economic development, um, uh, observe, uh, uh, re explaining observed mortality reduction. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is lengthy, but um, hopefully of some interest. Um, we've got some evidence on welfare implications that are generally not available for programs like this. We've done detailed household expenditure uh, assessments at various points in the, in the work, 
and we've estimated income based on household expenditures, savings, and borrowing. Um, we've annualized the use of uh, uh, cost of assets, um, imputed missing values, and done some other tricky things, basically to come up with a measure of what we consider an annualized value of net worth of each of the families, not an, a measure of income. But from this evidence, um, we've been able to look at what the changes in the economic uh, situation in, in Bioko have been over the five years, uh, first five years. This is a Lorenz curve that looks at income inequality in the country. Um, the two curves of particular interest are the blue and the black. Uh, the others are sort of rural Africa and urban Africa uh, comparators. Um, what you see is that the line has shifted down from blue to black, and the further it gets away from that line, that midline, it means that there's greater inequality in income distribution. And in particular, you can see down at the bottom that the share of total income in the country um, earned by the, bot the poorest 20% of the income distribution has dropped from 7% in 2004 down to 1% of total income in 2009. So the, the share of income owned by the poor is, is reduced. A similar reduction, however, is observed in the top 20%, which has dropped from 47 to 43%, which means that there's been a growing middle class that's gone on that, that is now um, accounting for more of the income in the, in the uh, country. So there's a trickle down occurring. Um, economic growth has led to poverty reduction uh, fairly unambiguously on the island. Uh, this is looking at the percentage of, of houses that live on $2 or less a day, these are individuals, has dropped down from 40% to 15% in the, four, in the five years. And the percentage living on a dollar or less a day, which is the uh, Millennium Development Goal metric, has dropped down from 15% to 5%. So in this five-year period, Equatorial Guinea has met and surpassed the Millennium Development Goal, which is to have the number of individuals living on a dollar or less a day. So uh, there's a lot of money in the country and there's a lot of wealth, but you know there is some good things happening on, on this side. Looked at in terms of purchasing power, this is a, an equivalent kind of measure in looking at being able to buy 2,300 calories of goods and services plus basic needs. And you see a similar decline. Those in relative poverty can buy that basic needs goods package of goods has dropped down from 30% to 15%, while those who can only afford the 2,300 calories has remained constant. So fewer are living on less than a dollar a day, but the cost of living has gone up. So these people, that's still 10% of the population that can only afford um, that basket of that, that, the, the food, the minimal caloric requirements. Um, the project itself has had a very substantial impact on, on the welfare of the population. The cost of malaria care has been reduced uh, by about half. This has benefited the whole population as a whole, but it's benefited the poor, particularly when expressed as a proportion of their income. And you can see that on the right, the, poor, um, the poorest 10% of the population, the cost of reducing malaria care, this is just the treatment costs of malaria care, has come down, uh, represents a savings of about 24% or about a quarter of their income. So it's, it's like the equivalent of giving them a cash grant of an increase in their salaries or their income by about a quarter. Um, whereas for the richest, it's been uh, about 5%. So everybody has benefited from the reduced cost of treatment and certainly the rich on an absolute level have benefited more, but on a proportionate level, the poor have. So it's been a very pro-poor uh, intervention. Um, so we conclude, I think, fairly unambiguously that malaria control is a very effective adjunct to economic growth for poverty alleviation, and it's a highly effective way of redistributing oil revenue uh, to the poor. So with that, uh, let's take a quick look at the future. Um, malaria, uh, malaria, Bioko ascribes uh, and is committed to the Global Malaria Action Plan, uh, seeking, if possible, to eliminate malaria from, from Bioko. We recognize that this is an enormous challenge and that we're a long way from getting there, but there is a commitment on the part of Marathon and this group to get there, if, if at all possible. Um, we are probably we are at the point now of sustained control for those that, that know this, so we've scaled up all of the interventions to have impact. We've seen a result of that impact. We're struggling now uh, to keep that impact, uh, that, that scale up going, and to bring, uh, to bring the incidence of malaria down. To get to pre-elimination, we're looking at one or two cases uh, per thousand. We're substantially higher than that now. Uh, so we've got a long-term perspective. So we've gone, the first two phases have gotten us to uh, sustained control. The third phase is, we hope, looking at pre-elimination. Um, but I think Marathon has a long-term, as Adele said, uh, extractive horizon. Uh, we're talking 20 to 40 years. 
We've talked about five, we've talked about ten of those years here. Um, we're already contemplating potentially a third phase here for pre-elimination. Marathon and its partners are, are prepared to stay and see, th see this out through the course. It's an unprecedented uh, level of commitment. So I think it's interesting to have a perspective, I, I hope you find it interesting, from a PVO about what it's like to work uh, with this, uh, this group, uh, both with the government and, and the private partners here. Um, this partnership is without question the reason this thing has been successful. As Michelle, Michelle indicated, we have two models in Equatorial Guinea. We have the Global Fund model and we have the Marathon Government of Equatorial Guinea model. And uh, we're, we've been locked into a fixed uh, funding stream and a fixed program stream that on the on the mainland that was designed two years before we went in there and really didn't know that much about what was going on on the mainland we've been stuck there and even though we can we can show evidence that we need to change in a traditional very traditional funding arrangement that frankly AID and everybody else will do you're stuck you've got to stay with it okay so you live with what you got on Bioko we've changed dramatically as a result of information sometimes in a matter of two weeks when we first had insecticide resistance which cost us uh, the cost marathon about four million dollars that decision was literally made in a week uh, provide the evidence substantiate it discuss the implications go back to the corporate uh, heads and make a decision and like that we switched and I, that's extremely unprecedented I think most would concur so what are the assets that each bring in it's a, it, it works because we can leverage what the government brings to the table which is obviously the legal and statutory framework uh, some we, they contribute a third of the financing of the project and there's an infrastructure and human resource base that's ultimately as I said 97 percent of what we do is done by Aquato Guineans and we anticipate that 100% of it will be done within the next five, the next few years here. The oil companies bring in this financial wherewithal, financial flexibility, a results-oriented, frankly, engineering view of the issue. Show me the problem. There's no problem that can't be solved with good information and a good engineered solution. An enormous logistics base. We'd still be offloading the first truck out of the port if it was MCDI's responsibility. These guys can make things move. All right, um, government relations. When we have a problem with the Minister of Health, this goes right to the top. You know, there is just, uh, there is nothing that stops this train from moving, and it's in large part because of that ability to do it. And this very unusual long-term commitment to be involved in an en entity and an en engagement investment where you can see a 15, 20 year horizon, I mean, that's sustainability. I don't know what people's definition of sustainability is, but if you can guarantee that you've got flexible funding for 20 years, th that's a pretty enviable situation. The nonprofit MCDI in this case, we hope, brings in knowledge on health and development and the social sector, and we're a nonprofit, so I'm going to say by default we're cost effective. So um, we bring in the research institutions, as you've seen from Michelle and others, bring in specialized state of the art knowledge scientific rigor, um, education, and very important dissem information dissemination, which has brought a lot of attention to this uh, effort. And the community uh, organizations bring in the local knowledge, ac access and credibility, and, and obviously a long-term commitment. Um, I just want to speak a little bit more about Marathon here uh, and what they do. Um, they're, this, the project is successful because they have um, supported rapid uh, startup and achievement. Um, they, uh, you know, they provide customs clearance support, as I mentioned, the infrastructural support. Um, they directly participate in decision making with us. We, we meet with them weekly. Uh, they know what's going on and they participate on that. Um, they, are, they are interested in interventions that have bring the greatest bang for the buck. So they're looking for new innovations, new technologies, new answers, and they're always willing to go where, frankly, other institutions might be more scared to go. So IRS was a good example. When we started in 2004, RBM, you, there was one paragraph in the World Malaria Report, made about one page on, on IRS. Well, the Harvard's experts said, no, IRS can work. It worked in the 1950s. It can work again in sub-Saharan Africa. And so they invested in that. And, and Bioko, in large part, showed that. And the PMI's use of it, and now RBM's adoption of it is not is related to what has happened here on Bioco. So it's, um, they're, they're committed uh, on a long term to it. I'm going to skip ahead, but this is, you know, I think that, that uh, engagement by Marathon has been critical uh, in the process. At the same time, we're all, we all have our frailties. We all bring um, limitations to the table. 
Uh, the government, in, in spite of a really considerable effort uh, for it, is an extremely weak, uh, has extremely weak public administration, uh, a weak health sector, and so that's part of the struggle here. You turn every corner and it's, well, this system doesn't exist in the ministry, so we're going to have to help build that one. And so it literally be almost becomes a health sector development uh, program. Um, there's also, frankly, been variable political will here, uh, depending on which minister has been there. And some have been highly supportive and some less. And uh, so it's taken some of the advocacy in order to be able to move us forward at various times. Um, and this, this very innovative social development fund, which they've set up, which has funded primary health care and a number of initiatives, and it currently has an $80 million malaria control fund set up for, the, for continuing the Global Fund project, which is now no longer going to take place because Equatorial Guinea has disqualified itself from Global Fund resources because the per capita income is so high. That is to be picked up by the Social Development Fund, but teaching the government and the ministry how to account for those resources so that they can actually get those $80 million, that's proved to be a challenge, so um, that's a work in progress right there. The, the oil companies are great. They've pushed us very hard, but sometimes they push almost too hard, and they, their agenda is not totally aligned always with the, the timeline for social sector uh, change. And so trying to get things done and being willing to bypass even the Minister of Health at times when that's been necessary, well, that puts, I'll tell you, that puts MCDI in a very strange position where it's actually got, it's got to work with that Minister of Health sometimes. So, you know, that, that's one of the downsides. But frankly, if that's what we have to deal with, we've been pretty, pretty happy that that's our, our, our problem. But it has led to a certain amount of confusion and distrust within the health sector at times. Uh, we are a small entity. Uh, we are dependent on a few individuals, uh, so we're subject to those limitations. Um, and our management systems, frankly, have had to ramp up in order to be capable to, to report to uh, the corporate donor here in a way that even is more demanding than AID, which, which is already fairly demanding. Uh, the research institutions sometimes find it hard to focus on what's operationally significant and are thinking about more esoteric research. Um, they often have time difficulty making a definitive recommendation. There's so many what ifs out there. Well, if this happens, well, then we would say that, but, but this could prevail, and so we're not going to say that. So, and they're not really always willing to accept the second best decision here, so um, we have to work with them on that. But uh, again, they bring a lot more to the table than, they, than they, uh, when they're detracting elements. Um, and the community organizations in Equatorial Guinea are nascent. They're, they're, uh, the Red Cross has been a very big part of our program, particularly for bed net distributions. Uh, but um, it's unlike most African countries, NGOs are, are few and far between on the island, and so that's been a, a limiting factor. Um, this is just the story that I think is unprecedented in terms of funding. Um, we've gone through uh, changes that have been led by a number of structural factors. Uh, you know, when we started out, certainly Marathon wasn't expecting that this was going to cost what it did. Certainly from a management perspective, we don't want to hang our hats on the fact that we've caused them to have to ratchet up their budget every, every year. But the fact is that under the conditions prevailing in the country, conditions related to this housing boom, 20% average annual growth, unprecedented, no one foresaw it. So we're, we're spraying houses, you got to spray more houses. That's going to cost a lot more money. Uh, entomological conditions changing. Michelle has talked about resistance. We didn't, we, the literature didn't suggest this resistance existed. It did. It doubled the cost of the IRS program overnight. Uh, outdoor biting, which is now making our indoor activities less, less um, effective, that's going to require a change in strategy. So that's, that's a change thing. Um, changing in understanding about control interventions, you know, the using um, outdoor strategies, f the need for focal interventions, and finally, economic conditions changing. Um, inflation, uh, currency appreciation, which has caused local costs to go up. All of those things have led at various times to need for structural change in the budget. And unlike any other development project that I'm aware of, and certainly that MCDI has ever been funded by, we've gone through what is that, five or a year? Every year we've gone through an adjustment in that first phase. Now, that's a little bit embarrassing, but it's what has made this thing actually work, uh, that we are continuing to fight it aggressively is because of that flexibility. So very briefly, conclusions. We've gone way, way beyond where we should have here. We've, we've reduced the force of transmission. We've reduced the prevalence of infection. We've reduced, we've achieved the Millennium Development Goal for under five mortality. The country has achieved the MDG for poverty eradication. 
and, and certainly this project has had a big impact on helping that. Um, we've, I think, shown the, uh, demonstrated the need for um, a, a strong m and &E system that allows you to be adaptive and change. The results speak to that. Um, we've confirmed the need for scaling up and keeping scale up. We've, we've lost progress at times where we haven't been able to maintain that scale up. Um, and we've demonstrated, I think, the, effect, uh, the, the effectiveness of this kind of public-private partnership. So with that long thing, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Well, I want to really thank the panel. I know I was very adamant uh, early to leave ample time for discussion, but I, I really think it was very useful to have such a kind of in-depth, comprehensive look at the kind of many spin-off effects of this and kind of looking at the project from different directions. From um, So I want to thank you all for that. Um, I, I, we'll, we'll open up for 15, maybe 20 minutes of, of discussion. Um, I, I, I'd like to start, I mean, there's so many uh, interesting things that uh, come out of this, kind of the, the impact on the health system more broadly and how perhaps Marathon in future will, will leverage that, but we'll open it up. Let me just start with um, the, the government responsibility. I know we, um, in, in this, you said they're, they're funding a third of this um, and they're stepping in now to take over the global fund programming, is that, is that correct? One of the trends in, in U.S. PEPFAR assistance is moving towards this kind of partnership framework agreement where the responsibilities of the government are outlined as well as uh, those of the implementing and the, or the funding partner. And I wonder how, you know, maybe uh, Chris or um, uh, Adele, you might, I mean, how do you see this translating in terms of kind of pushing the government to take up a little bit more role. As, as we all know, Equatorial Guinea is not lacking for, for money. It's lacking for capacities, yes. But I wonder how, how do you see the private sector's role in, in terms of pushing them that direction? We'll start with that and then go for a round of, of questions. Thanks. Uh, I was expecting actually this question, Jennifer, so be prepared. I think before I answer the, the, the path forward, let's look at the history of, of this. When we started the project in 2003, uh, at that time, there was not uh, strong capacity, neither actually were the financing in the country. So they actually, there, we started at the base where 90% of the project was funded by the private sector, mostly by us and our partners. So the government actually had a 10% uh, commitment to take. I think if you look at that, uh, we also looked at the structure of the Ministry of, of Health, which is basically the ministry for whom we were doing this work. The, this is the most endemic country in Africa. The uh, department uh, that is handling this project, which is the, uh, the National Air Program, had three full-time people in the most endemic country. So clearly you cannot count on uh, an infrastructure to basically deliver on a very large scale project or even manage it financially here. So, so what we've done over the first five years, and Chris mentioned that, one of the biggest pieces is as we're developing the, the five elements, one of them is always being sustainability, which is trying to create an environment where the ministry and the government actually have a bigger role as we move forward. In the second phase, uh, we did two things. The financial share was proportionate, you know, with uh, the increase into the, the infrastructure of the project, so they are going to one third uh, of, of the cost of the project. But at the same time, we have made uh, some key metric adjustments where, Chris mentioned one of them here, 97% of the operating team is national mm -hmm. employees, which is very large actually for, if you can look at the number of uh, health initiatives, public uh, sector, health programs, it's a very large number. And we have made a commitment to actually have the government involved in the management. This is including the financial, administrative, and technical management. So the team that Chris mentioned is being trained now in Peru, was before that in Mexico, uh, and is going to be the next generation of leaders to take this project forward. Um, everything has its own time and its, its own um, format. So it's clear the government is having more revenues, now we're building the capacity. Uh, if we do move, uh, or when we move into phase three, we will see them involved at a much higher level in terms of financial commitment. Uh, we will also see them much more involved in terms of executing on the project. So I think this is also a very delicate project. If we miss in terms of executing on our strategy, we have the high risk of reverting all the gains we've done in this country and basically fall into the same situation that happened in uh, Satomi in Principia, which is on basically the decided to stop. We don't want to have that. We don't want to actually, uh, after all this gain, start all over again. So we have to be very careful in how we do the transition. So we see it 
taking more place towards the, the end of this phase and the third phase with a higher financial commitment from the government and higher commitment in terms of technical and managerial oversight. Uh, we'll take a, a few at a time. Deirdre, here. And there's a mic, and if you could um, introduce yourself. Uh. My name is Deirdre Lepin. I'm affiliated with the African Studies Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much, all of you, for a fascinating presentation, because I have a background both in health and corporate social responsibility. It was fascinating. Um, I want to address uh, a couple of questions to Adele or anyone else who wants to pitch in. Um, my first question is um, this. How do you, as a company, uh, describe to yourselves the benefit of this project to you and your bottom line? I mean, it's obviously beneficial to people, but how do you as a company view it as beneficial? And secondly, um, expanding a little bit on Jennifer's question, how do you as a company see the potential of making a change in that Gini coefficient, the Lorenz curve that you showed. How could you somehow, through the EITI or other mechanisms, expand that middle class? Because we know that one of the major determinants of health is increased income and, and uh, wealth. Great. Yes. Uh, Mike's coming. Hi, this is Margaret Rees from CSIS, and I was just curious, I think you said that in Equatorial, <coughs> sorry, Equatorial Guinea, Marathon was one of the largest private employer, um, so it is still surprising that Marathon's put such a big investment into this kind of work um, in that area, but it, it obviously, you know, if that's your workforce, you want to keep them healthy and it makes sense, but I'm curious in terms of your programs, if you have them, I'm assuming Marathon has um, social responsibility programs around the world. And I'm curious how this has translated in those settings where maybe you're not, you know, in, in Equatorial Guinea, you're really going to be um, benefiting from this because you're sort of the big gun. So I wonder how that works in your other programs. Yes, we are actually connected to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's, uh, yes, you're in the middle and then we'll come to the front. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm an associate with PAHEF uh, and a student at George Washington University. Um, my question is more on a micro level. Um, I actually um, had this question when uh, you guys were talking about implementation um, as a community. Um, and I wanted to know how accessible is your health information system? Um, and is it more than just um, internet and brochures? What exactly are you guys doing to make sure that the people know um, what they can do to better protect themselves. Um, also, my second question is, um, how's the trust um, between uh, Marathon and the community being built up, and how is that being sustained um, as you guys transition um, from Marathon management to um, population uh, management in Equatorial Guinea? Thank you. Let's take one last in this round. Sorry to load you up, but the, uh, up in the front. Uh, thanks. I'm Lisa Misol with Human Rights Watch. Um, I want to come back to um, an underlying theme, um, which was raised about the government's role, and uh, and ask you to expand on the political commitment dimension, and starting with the origin of this project. Um, and you've noted that the government's uh, financial commitment, uh, at least theoretically, is is increasing. Uh, but I'd like to hear how it came about and what the government's role was then. And in terms of the financial commitment, to break down what has been the actual versus promised. <laughs> Um, commitment because the social development fund, as was hinted at, uh, is in theory very interesting but hasn't really delivered dollars um, to date uh, as a country that's very wealthy and got these high levels of malaria incidents because of a lack of investment in its people. So I'd like to hear more about that and, and really tease out <coughs> what the outlook is for the future, which is the third component. Kind of over time, how do you see the political um, will uh, as a factor in malaria control in the country? Great. Uh, where shall we start? Do you um, okay. do you want to start? To Let me cover or? some. Of, there are okay. three questions, all yeah. dealing with the yeah. government, political will, um, marathon versus uh, CSR strategy, and so forth. So maybe I can lump them up all together here. And Chris, if you don't mind covering the community piece yeah. and so forth. At least a two question here. 
I think the level of activity in, in the country here, and not to defend EG or, 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 or else, I mean, it's uh, when we came in, it, it was endemic, it's been endemic for a long time. So basically we came in a time where they were peaking and we came in another time. So in terms of the political commitment, uh, you asked about the financial support. Uh, first phase, 10%, this is not uh, theoretical, actually they paid their bills. Um, you know, we collected on, on their bills. The uh, uh, second uh, phase, which is 30%, we are collecting as we speak, literally every month we're collecting. So they are pay physically paying their share of uh, the program. So it's not theoretical. This is something that it was one of the conditions for us to continue in a second phase. If they didn't have a uh, financial commitment in the game, we would not be involved. As a matter of fact, uh, both financial commitments you know, were negotiated at the highest level within the government beyond actually the Ministry of Health was done at the level of the presidential um, office. So the commitment is at the highest level for the uh, intent of the uh, benefiting communities. Uh, and we see that moving forward again, the proportion should evolve in the third phase uh, to where they're taking the lead role and the companies are actually are supporting. Now coming back to the question about how does it play to uh, uh, the bottom line and its impact on the middle class. Uh, for those who've been following EG, actually, if, if you go and have a look right now, uh, there is an immediate impact. If you look at the curve that Chris showed, and of course Chris is an economist, a PhD in economy, he can explain to you how a middle class is created. It shows definitely that you have migrations from the uh, uh, basically top earning classes and the, uh, the poorest of the poor, and you see a bigger middle class being created. We see that happening within even our workforce. Uh, so we are creating the, the middle class. Uh, we see them, they're able to have a much higher purchasing power. We know their salaries, you know what they are doing. We, we see their evolving habits. So middle class has been created uh, as we speak. Uh, I can't tell you how large it is. We can just see some of the, the metrics around that. And of course, as being the largest uh, employer in the private sector, it does have a multiplier effect because the middle class will actually start spending there. Um, in terms of um, the question around the uh, benefits of the bottom line, I'm sure you're asking, okay, we are spending $27 million on the phase, uh, 16 on another one, and so forth. I, I think we have to, we usually look at uh, our portfolio of activities in a given country. I showed specifically, I made the introduction to show how our strategies and CSR, how we look at uh, the distribution between philanthropy versus sustainable development. And certainly this project is not something we qualify as a, a philanthropic project. This is a sustainable development project. It was driven by a business case. We entered into a country that was highly endemic. It was very endemic for our employees, uh, our expat, as well as our national employees. So we thought, let's do something about it, not only for the employees, but also for their families. Uh, if you take, when we got in, you take one cycle of uh, Malaria, it takes 21 days in general of a person's life. They're just down, they can't do anything here. Actually, Dr. Benevente mapped uh, in one of our businesses the number of lost uh, productivity uh, days uh, just from the impact of this project. They can show the impact of an implementation of large-scale initiative uh, to, uh, to our business. Because when you have a lost time, it's for the earning uh, person, but also when they have a sick child or a sick spouse, they can't come to work. They have to attend for those. This is not even counting the cost involved in, um, in spending on actually on, on treatment. So there is a multiplier effect and, and it does have a benefit to that. I think when you look at our portfolio of programs around the world, I specifically show those. Uh, clearly, uh, the portfolio is tailored to the issues in the country, is tailored to the investment that we have in the country. So of course, if we are in an exploration phase, we would have a lot less spending on CSR versus if we are in a production phase or actually we are exiting a specific country. So um, at that time when we entered, EG was one of our largest um, investment assets in, in Africa and one of the most challenging uh, socially. Uh, so uh, there is a strong link to the commitment financially and the size of the project to our, the size of our presence and the size of the challenge we're facing there. Right, and let me, I'll just speak a little bit more to the um the communication strategy and, and, and how we're trying to um, uh, get the message across about health prevention. And um, so we, as I talked, we, we have a community outreach program. So we not only send these teams out twice a year, they go literally to every house and talk to them. I don't know, we in a sort of comprehensive, integrated set of messages that, that, you know, is a five to 10 minute session with a householder twice a year, which is a fairly intensive engagement. Um, there's a lot of community education meetings that are organized. There are um, there's street theater groups that go out. There's a, there's a range of different uh, um, community outreach activities that are done, um, including uh, working through the, the, the Red Cross of Equatorial Guinea uh, to get out. Um, 
everybody that comes to a health center is going to be presented with information on the wall. They're going, we've worked with providers to try to be better educators uh, to the patient. And we have, there are dedicated Ministry of Health IEC staff who are in each one of these facilities. And, and when groups of women or caregivers or patients are congregated, they talk to them and, you know, their audio, their visual aids that are there. And, um, and it actually, I mean, I've been out, it actually, it actually takes place and it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Um, uh, there is mass media, and and you know that that does play a role. Uh, I don't in terms of behavior change. I'm not sure it's uh, you know the the key role, but uh, things like you know for instance when the government switched its policy to allowing universal free distribution of drugs, it was very important that this information get out to everybody. That in an otherwise cost recovery oriented health system where they are going to pay for just about everything else you know, malaria care is free and getting that message across so that there aren't under the table payments and other things that are going on was an important thing that was done through mass media. Um, and then there's a lot of advocacy events, um, it, working with community leaders. It's taken us, you know, frankly, it took us about five years to get the Ministry of Interior to bring its, you know, district presidents to the table. This is a country that has a very strong capability to control its, uh, um, it's political hierarchy, right? And so it was always distressing to us that we couldn't get them to actually leverage this. But we do have them doing this now, and, and they're proud of it. I mean, just attended, I was there two weeks ago, attended the first award ceremony where, you know, a district president, you know, proudly received a certificate for having had the highest spray coverage in his district, you know. And so slowly but surely, and, and in a place like this where you can actually get a government to make a decision that's going to do something, it's amazing what they, what they can do. They, they're there, <laughs> and they can have an impact, so. I don't know if that answered your question, but all right. I wonder, we go for another round, but um, I wonder now that if the global fund is now moving away from the mainland, how is kind of what, how, what's going to be your relationship to what happens on the mainland? One of the things that struck me was kind of the, the amount of operational research that you're doing and how that, that then that feeds back and you're able to change things up, which I think is, as you said, is missing from a lot of the U.S. and, and kind of large uh, uh, large donor, and it's kind of a special asset that the private sector has. But so is that also is that model going to get kind of replicated on on the mainland? Uh, I don't know how, what how large of a role you'll have within that mainland effort. Well, that's going to be largely up to the government of Equatorial Guinea to determine. They, we were involved with them in laying out uh, this $80 million investment strategy, which is a five-year strategy. Um, among the things that happened on the Global Fund project is that we weren't able, given the Global Fund resources, to actually do IRS and ITNs together. So the two provinces with the highest population density got IRS and the lower population density areas got ITNs. The evidence shows real synergies between this, and in fact, given the problems on the mainland of bringing malaria down, it's really critical that they actually do these together. So the, the project foresees this, but um, you know, the, the, the release of these funds is still, still waiting, and that has largely to do with public accountability. The, the government, the Ministry of Health's ability to account for the resources that they've gotten from the Social Development Fund, and they have gotten resources. I mean, this whole community health network thing has been completely funded through that. Um, and, you know, the government has approved, the, the Social Development Fund Board has approved this $80 million investment. It's literally sitting there waiting because the auditors have shown that, you know, the ministry has not accounted accurately and well enough for the, for the monies that it's had. So they're, they're working with trying to get that, and once that's done, we're told that, that this money's going to come forward. Once that happens, BIOCO will continue to have a role to play, that national health information system. It's in our interest to know what's going on on the mainland in terms of cases. And so we're going to continue to support that. Uh, entomological monitoring, we can support that from the technical people that we have on the, on the island. So we, you know, we've invested five years in, on the mainland. We're, we're not going to walk away uh, from it. Obviously, our capacity to do things will be, will be more limited. But part of the Social Development Fund project, depending on how the government wants to do this, has the ability to hire technical assistance. Whether they choose to go with MCDI or a different model or different organization is really up to them. But finances are not going to be the limiting factor. It's going to be human resources, and, and that's the real challenge. I, and, I, and I'll say that the Global Fund, when we originally started with them, made a very strong case that if this was an A-rated project, that you know, they, there, was a, there was a prevailing mechanism for non-competitive rollover and that, you know, that they saw it as a long-term commitment. But, you know, their own rules 
ultimately Equatorial Guinea's wealth disqualified them. And you know, actually, Marathon and others tried to advocate with the board at the Global Fund to 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 give a particular dispensation for Equatorial Guinea, but they, you know, they 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 didn't do that in the end. So, um, you know, I don't know exactly what is going to play out. I, it's it's unfortunate. You know what what's happened, but I think in, if there's any country that actually could put the resources on the table to do it, it, it's Equatorial Guinea, and and they and it's designed, it's there, it just needs to be released. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marcus Squino, um, with the State Department. Um, USAID was mentioned a couple of times, and and I was curious of what degree of cooperation you have with USAID, what kinds of programs they have uh, that you you kind of complement. Uh, and then my, my other question is, uh, I understand that there's, there's a small group of Peace Corps volunteers uh, in Equatorial Guinea. And again, just curious whether you have any interaction with them, whether they assist you in any way. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Actually, uh, uh, USAID has a very unique situation in EG. Uh, most, in most cases, uh, USAID uh, receives money from the U.S. government through our taxpayers' money to spend in development programs. This is the only project USAID actually is receiving money from a country, which is EG. Uh, the first uh, installment was done four years ago, was, uh, $7 million. I had another $8 million. And uh, he, uh, the US, he actually, USAID became almost the administrator of the set of four areas of priorities, health, education, environment, and women's affairs, and which led to the creation to what uh, Chris mentioned earlier, the Social Development Fund. So the project for malaria, the $80 million proposal, was developed you know, uh, by USAID, uh, working with the MCDI and the Ministry of Health and so forth, and a number of other projects were developed under the same mechanism. The intent for USAID is to become almost like a broker making sure the mechanisms are in place and making sure there's also a mechanism to spend the money in a, in a very, um, I would say, structured way. So yes, we worked very closely with the USAID, but certainly in a completely different format what we've done in the past, where usually we worked on uh, execution projects. Uh, the Peace Corps um, is no longer there. Actually, the Peace Corps was there until, I believe, uh, the early 90s. Well, this month, well, actually, we had a couple of Peace Corps guys come in and work with us in the early project. Um, I do not believe the Peace Corps will be reintroduced uh, in EG for a number of reasons. One of them at EG is not in the same scale as it was when the Peace Corps was there, just because it became a high earner, at least on a GDP basis. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wamaka Oparuji. I'm a graduate student of um, Community Public Health and Global Health from University of Maryland, Baltimore. And um, my first question is about, um, I wanted to find out if there was any environmental hazards that are to humans associated with the ICP that you use for the eradication of the vectors. And um, my other question is about the uh, I was listening um, to Michelle when you were talking about the number of um, measuring the number of infective um, bites per year, and as I wanted to find out how did you measure that. All right, let me first. Uh, let's uh, let's take a couple more. But that's a good question that I was wondering as well, <laughs> the gentlemen. The bites, or the, <laughs> the bites, yeah. <laughs> it's human baiting. It's anyway. Um, uh, my name is Phil Coyne. I'm at Uniform Services University. I just have a question about other vector-borne diseases uh, in Bioko. I know that in the past, the APOC program, the Onco program, actually was spraying for onchocerciasis there, but I don't know what the current status is. And of course, I think there's lymphatic filariasis there as well, which is another mosquito-borne disease. So I'm just wondering if there's been any attempt to measure some of your collateral benefits of this program in the context of other vector-borne diseases. Hi, Nicholas Cook from the Congressional Research Service. Um, given the small scale of Equatorial Guinea and this top-down political support for the program and uh, the can-do attitude of Marathon, uh, as, as described earlier, uh, these seem to have facilitated this program. And, and, but what impact, how would you compare the scalability 
uh, to other countries or the replicability to other countries. I mean, these, these were kind of unique factors. In a much bigger country with less centralized top-down control, what would be different? Sure. All right, let me say a little bit about uh, the public health um, dangers of spraying um, insecticide um, in, in terms of IRS and bed nets. Um, any study that I'm aware of hasn't shown any effect on, on human health whatsoever. The amounts of insecticide used are really um, quite, quite small compared to um, some of the uses in, in agriculture, for example, and exposure to humans is extremely limited. And the benefit, surely, of, of spraying is much larger than, you know, than, than, um, than the potential danger. In terms of the human uh, landing catches, they, they are basically um, um, human volunteers that um, uh, sit with their legs exposed with an aspirator, and they collect mosquitoes that land on their legs. Um, and these are, human, uh, these are natives of uh, Equatorial Guinea. They have um, acquired immunity. Um, there is a doctor involved that provides treatment if needed. And um, these treatments or these catches have been um, approved by the, the ethics committee, um, of course, of the Equatorial Guinea government, but also of the, the um, uh, London School of Tropical Medicine and, and Health. So it's a it's a fairly widely used collection method, actually. We hire volunteers, by the way. We have a list. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get a long line on that one. <laughs> There is some consequences in uh, on Bioco and vector control and mass uh, drug administration. We we haven't worked closely uh, with them, but uh, we we intend to because um, mass drug administration is fairly similar to active case detection in the case of malaria, and particularly for school children and certain population can be done in their schools. The last question on replicability and the unique. <coughs> I'll address that one if you don't mind. Um, you do mention there are some two key attributes, yes, the, uh, the the geopolitical situation. Clearly, an island setting is much more favorable than than within the middle of a continent. Uh, the the approach we have taken, yes, there were very strong attributes. What we've done uh, in the past uh, few years, we've done a lot of benchmarking with other projects uh, done um, in partnership by the private sector and governments. We looked at uh, activities in Angola. We looked at uh, South Africa. We looked at Ghana recently, actually, Chris. Uh, and I and others were there recently. So clearly, you know, uh, there's a ring fencing situation when you are in open land trying to define the parameters there that are fairly challenging. But however, I, I, would, I would say uh, it's, not all, it's not all rosy here. The fact that we have very um, strong issues around the resistance, we've seen, you know, um, DNA um, mutations and so forth, it, it is not uh, straightforward. So what we gain on a geopolitical side here, we might be challenged on another side. So I would say it's even here. So the scalability and replicability here will vary greatly for each country. Could I just add to that? I, I think one of the real limiting factors, and it's surprising, I mean, we've had colleagues who've worked, you know, 25 years in Africa, and they've come to EG, and we said, you know, you're going to be surprised, and they say, oh, no, I've, we've been here. And a month after they're there, they say, I, I've never seen anything like this. And I, it's, it's hard to describe. But the, the human resource capacity is their huge, this is their big challenge. I mean, they, they, they've had no educational base. And so they're, 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 they're scurrying now to build that human resource base. You compare that with a place like Nigeria or Ghana or, I mean, anywhere in Francophone West Africa where you've just got a much stronger human resource base. So in some ways, the replicability and the scalability is easier in another context than it is in Equatorial Guinea. Um, I, it, no, no question the scale is, is advantageous and the fact that it's on an island is advantageous. But, uh, you know, you can sort of look at this as sort of a district-based activity in another country. And, well, okay, so there's a decentralization in other countries. And, I mean, that's something that's only nascent in Equatorial Guinea. They, district health management teams don't exist and they're just being conceived of. So, you know, in countries where you have a more decentralized framework, the issue, the challenge, of course, is, you know, is some of the, the mix of, uh, interventions like IRS. I mean, that durable lining is a very attractive proposition if resistance phenomena don't prevent it from being used because uh, putting something in a house that lasts five years versus going in twice a year to try to spray, uh, you know, that's, that's a really fantastic thing. I think the other thing and, and part of what for us is interesting about the Bioco experience and, and partnering with Marathon is that we're looking down the road at 
you know, maybe these silver bullets out there, but looking at, you know, at vaccines down the road or other interventions, that, you know, whatever is coming down the, the pike, one of the, benef one of the benefits of having a tremendous monitoring and evaluation system is that anybody that's developing any kind of new strategy has an interest in coming in and showing, being able to show an impact. So, um, you know, that's, that's part of it. I think the answer for Africa is economic development and, you know, some of the, the changes that are going to occur in housing and, and the ability to prevent these things through that economic development. And, and hopefully down the pike, if we can make an impact and sustain an impact for, you know, a decade or more, you know, some other approach like a vaccine is ultimately what's, I think, going to be required to eliminate. Yeah. Right, but there, I mean, there's a good example of the replicability. I mean, we, we went in, we used the Bioko model, we implemented it. We have not had the same degree of success. And I think actually, and that I think is going to be one of the things that for the literature is going to be very important, that we can show why we haven't had success. And, and, it, and it has been the fact that we've been trapped in a pair, you know, in, a, in, a, in the original proposal which simply has not been able to respond to the change, to what we've learned and the changing circumstances. You know, and the data that Michelle put up there about resistance phenomenon, I mean, going from, you know, 64% to 84% of the mosquitoes having that gene, you know, and, well, you can't use perithroids there. So what are you going to do? And the fact that you don't have a program that can adjust to that. So replicability has also to do not just with the context, but with the donor, and what are they going to do and allow you to do to change? So. Again, Equatorial Guinea is in a very enviable position, that $80 million, assuming that the Social Development Fund allow, doesn't micromanage that. And, and actually, I've seen the, the work plan for this. It's, it's a horrific thing that looks about that thick, you know, which purports to, to micromanage this thing all the way. Assuming they don't do that, the resources are there to be able to adapt, and, and maybe they have a shot at it. I wanted to acknowledge the support from USAID through PMI and the technical support from CDC for this section on monitoring and evaluation. This, uh, those resources allow us to purchase computer to train, develop the health information system and train uh, the, the health workers that are in charge of managing the statistics. Yeah, that's very important. We, we were the, one of the first PMI recipients uh, before the big launching of the whole thing, and it, and they, it was formative. and. Uh, so, yeah, very, very important, yeah. I want to thank uh, the panel again. This has really been a um, really excellent uh, in-depth look. I think one of the things we'll look forward to kind of updates on your program, but I think also importantly the SDF uh, implementation um, by the Equatorial Guinea will be, uh, government will be something to to watch for as well. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank um, EG Justice uh, once again and Tutu Alicante and Joe. Um, thanks very much. And to our panelists for um, really great presentations. Thanks so much. <laughs> That's really interesting.